So can you name one uh, lesson or idea from abroad that's helped you address corruption in the UK? I think a big one is that people increasingly understand that there are victims of corruption and it's not some general economic malaise that has a marginal effect on people's lives. But we hear increasing stories now about um, how it affects individuals in their daily lives. Let me take an example from Zimbabwe, a tragic story of a young girl who was raped by somebody that uh, she knew. Uh, she and her parents took the case to the police and um, the rapist had got there first and paid a bribe, so he wasn't initially investigated or prosecuted. Now, thankfully, that story had a more positive outcome. But stories like that, I think, illustrate to policymakers in the UK, for example, the people who passed the UK Bribery Act, that this isn't some uh, uh, general theoretical concept. This is real people, real lives. Thank you. Um, are there any projects or innovations in the in the UK that might be valuable in helping to corrupt, tackle corruption elsewhere? The UK is going through an interesting period at the moment where it's coming up with some quite uh, um, interesting and imaginative ideas. So, for example, there was uh, a recent uh, anti-money laundering action plan that was launched just last week, and that came up with the concept of unexplained wealth orders. And that would mean that uh, if you're um, uh, an individual with corrupt money and you use it, for example, to buy uh, property in the UK, uh, then the property could be seized, frozen, while you explain the origin of your wealth. That kind of thing could be enormously powerful. The problem with legislation at the moment, both in the UK and elsewhere, is that um, if you are corrupt, it's quite difficult to prosecute you outside your home country without the cooperation of the officials in your home country. And you're very unlikely to get that cooperation. So an instrument like unexplained wealth orders could be very powerful for the UK and other jurisdictions. How can we improve the ways in which senior public officials work with civil society to address corruption uh, in the UK and overseas? There's a really patchy uh, story around the world of how civil society and public officials work together. In some jurisdictions, it's very good. In some jurisdictions, uh, it's uh, a mixture of mistrust and dislike. So um, I think something that can be really beneficial is from the public officials' point of view to be uh, open-minded about dealing with civil society, understanding what civil society's objectives are, uh, who the kind of people are that you're dealing with, what they're trying to achieve. And from civil society's point of view, I think having much greater uh, sympathy with uh, the position that public officials find themselves in, that often they're not the, uh, the really critical decision makers, that uh, the, uh, the politicians who uh, enact legislation are really a critical part of this, and public officials should be uh, the, the friends of civil society. So I think um, creating forums in which public uh, officials and civil society come together are really important, but also a greater understanding of where you're coming from. Okay. What are the biggest global challenges in addressing corruption over the next five years? In the next five years, uh, I would say two things. First of all, uh, that we have quite good global legislation, global frameworks at the moment, things like the OECD Anti-Bribery Convention, and yet enforcement is very poor. So I think much greater enforcement around the world is necessary because the truth is that there's a culture of impunity at the moment in many governments around the world and that absolutely needs to be tackled. That uh, if you have criminals who are in government or in public service or indeed in the private sector, they need to be brought to book. And that means enforcing existing mechanisms and legislation. The second thing, and I think this is much more difficult, is that the truth is that not everybody in world uh, leadership is really part of the fight against corruption. That some people themselves are corrupt and very deliberately don't want this global system to work. So I think the world needs to work out how to deal with those who are corrupt and in power, as well as how to uh, uh, use power against the corrupt when governments are willing. Yeah. And what's your favourite book? <laughs> My favourite book is uh, by Patrick O'Brien. Uh, it's called Master and Commander. And why is that? 
Why? Um, I, I'm a historian by background. I uh, have a PhD in a very obscure subject um, uh, in uh, 16th century Anglo-Venetian relations. And although Master and Commander is set in the, uh, the Napoleonic Wars, it's a fascinating recreation of those times. Uh, it also uh, talks a lot about the interplay between uh, big powers, France and, uh, the UK and Britain at that time. Uh, and it looks at corruption, of course, uh, both within the naval service, the Royal Navy, but also in politics, uh, uh, in uh, global politics and in national politics. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.